Tashi, David, uh, it's good to be here with you today. This is a very important day, uh, September 30th, Orange Shirt Day, and now it's a new national day for truth and reconciliation. Um, I'm really excited to be speaking with you today. I know we've got a lot to talk about, but uh, maybe I'll let you introduce yourself first. Thanks so much, uh, Mercy uh, Stryker. Uh, my name is David Danto. Um, I, uh, I'm on the board of directors of the Canadian Psychological Association. I'm also the head of psychology at the University of Guelph Humber, and I chair the standing committee on reconciliation. Um, it's, uh, it's an honor for me to join you, Stryker, uh, and uh, in this presentation today, um, addressing the field. I'd like to start out, if I could, with a brief uh, territorial acknowledgement. Uh, we begin this presentation by acknowledging that no matter where we are physically from coast to coast, we're meeting on Indigenous land that's been inhabited by Indigenous people since the beginning. As settlers, we're grateful uh, for the opportunity to meet here even if virtually, and we thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. Long before today, there have been Indigenous peoples who've been the stewards of this place. The head office of the Canadian Psychological Association is located in Ottawa, which is built on unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. As settlers, we entered into an agreement to share this land equitably. Our recognition of the contributions and the historic importance of Indigenous peoples must also be clearly and overtly connected to our collective commitment to make the promise and the challenge of truth and reconciliation real in all of our communities. We recognize and deeply appreciate the historic connection that Indigenous peoples have had to this particular place. We recognize the contributions that Métis, Inuit, and other Indigenous peoples have made, both in shaping and strengthening this community in particular, and our province and country as a whole. Thank you, David, for the land acknowledgement. Um, I take these to be very important to, uh, to everybody in Canada because it recognizes that we live in an indigenous space that we're, and that we're now here to share the land together as those treaties originally implied. I'm coming to you from the homeland of my people, the Métis, the Michif. I'm from the Red River Turtle Mountain area. I'm a Métis man. Um, I'm also the manager of the Indigenous Education Initiatives at the University of Saskatchewan. And I'm really honored to be the CPA chair of the Indigenous People section and a member of this committee for reconciliation. And that's really where how we met originally, David, did, wasn't it? when we wrote that report. It's been a long journey, but we've seen so many changes both in our profession and around us in society. It's been exciting times, don't you think? It was and, uh, and still is. And of course, we uh, that report that we worked on together came out in 2018. But uh, the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission held its closing ceremony in 2015. And, uh, and well before the report came out, we were working together uh, as, a, as a group, uh, you and I uh, and others who were involved uh, in that report uh, uh, on, on, that, uh, on that work. For certain, it was our colleagues that brought so much brilliance and wisdom that really helped us sort of get to a good place to where we are today. So, which brings us to the real reason we're here for today is we're here to talk about this new holiday that we have, the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Um, I don't know if many people realize this, but it wasn't an arbitrary decision that this was part of the calls to action number 80, uh, where it was asked by the asked upon the government to sort of create a day where we can stand and reflect on the issues that were raised through the truth and reconciliation and to really honor the survivors, the families and the communities that were impacted by Indian residential schools. So I, I don't know if you noticed this. Have you seen this flag before, David? No, I haven't. Um, I do see that it's orange, and I know that uh, that it's related to Orange Shirt Day. Some people have asked me, uh, you know, has this holiday replaced? Was it uh, is it the day that used to be called Orange Shirt Day that's now the new uh, national uh, day for truth and reconciliation, or is is Orange Shirt Day and the national uh, this new national holiday really uh, did, are they both continuing? Yeah, I think they're actually two separate things because I know the Orange Shirt Day was it was started a number of years back in Williams Lake and it was a recognition, the role of education and how when in resident, when survivors went to schools, they lost their choice, lost their opportunities and lost the clothing off their back in the case of the Orange Shirt, right? And so I think that that, day, that 
that is a movement towards to remember who we are and where we come from. And I, I really love the fact that Orange Shirt Day is taking on a greater meeting. When we have these moments where Canadian society is tasked with understanding and demonstrating its support to Indigenous people, I've now started seeing people wearing orange shirts. So I do think this holiday is its unique, is an important holiday where we reflect on the complicated past that is Canada. Um, but I also think that orange shirts and the orange shirt day is a different process. It's about showing your support, not just taking the time off to reflect. And so I think they're two separate things that need to be held separately, but recognizing they serve a similar purpose. Yeah, I guess it was, uh, it was Phyllis uh, Webstead. Yeah, um, Phyllis. I was going to say I was was, and the name was on the tip of my tongue there. Yeah, and uh, you know, and, and I, uh, my understanding is is that she was she was given an orange, an orange shirt, uh, from uh, from her grandmother, and that was confiscated when she was being processed, uh, essentially into uh, into Saint Joseph Mission Residential School, and so it's really. Uh, amazing to me that you know so many of these what I think are going to become and I hope are going to become new traditions and new directions are really coming from uh, you know individual people's powerful uh, examples uh, of of resilience that they are bringing forward and are really these these people are really um, using their own lives courageously as examples for all of us and I think that that's that that is embedded in, in a continuing part of this new national holiday too. Yeah, but I and haven't seen, but I haven't seen this that image uh, before. Sorry, striker. I don't know. Yeah, no, no, that that image is new. It just came out a few days ago. Uh, it was released by the the new Center for Truth and Reconciliation, the National Center, um, and they recognize that people really do want to take this moment and celebrate, not celebrate it, but to honor the Indigenous peoples and the tr troubles they've come through, right? And there's a lot of symbolism. And I encourage people to go to the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation and look up the flag. And there's a lot of symbolism that they've built into it, um, which honors and celebrates Indigenous culture, but for a purpose of re remembering what has happened and how hard we've had to fight to maintain our integrity as a community of people. So it's been, it's a beautiful thing to have. And I expect to have one of those flags as soon as they're available. But it's important, I think, that we also recognize that the reason for that flag and to celebrate Indigenous cultures in Canada um, and the strength, the resilience, the beauty of them comes out of a, a period of darkness for a lot of us, right? Um, I, I know a lot of Indigenous, I know a lot of people are impacted within the Indigenous communities that I belong to and the people and the colleagues that I have. Um, some of my, my closest friends and colleagues went to residential schools and, and it's a, such a difficult um, thing to overcome. Um, I think we need to spend a lot of time recognizing that this was a time in our history that was complicated. Um, it was harmful to Indigenous people. It was outright designed to harm and destroy us as a community of people. Um, and a lot of people don't really know a lot of the details. Um, what did you learn about residential schools when you were going to school, David? I didn't learn anything about residential schools. And in, in, in my experience, uh, most of my peers uh, had 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 the same uh, also uh, the same experience in terms of not having the residential schools uh, addressed uh, in in class. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a huge it's a huge omission, and it's more than merely an omission. It's an omission by the school system, which was at the time certainly in the service of the school system. So, you know, I think it's important for us to, uh, you know, we're seeing more acknowledgement now. I think it's really important for all of us to recognize that a critical, a self-reflective gaze is continually important for those of us, particularly those of us who are involved in the educational system, whether it's uh, in the primary school system or the post-secondary school system throughout. Uh, we all have a, a moral and an ethical obligation, I think, to, to right these wrongs and to address, uh, and to address the, uh, you know, what, what has happened uh, and with regard to our school system and the purpose that of the Indian residential schools, um, uh, which was really to uh, kill the Indian in the child.
Yeah, and sometimes they took that too far, right? Where there are so many children that didn't come home from those schools, um, and they really had uh, these were children that had no choice, that were innocent, and they had not done nothing wrong, and yet they were treated as if they were horrific individuals that needed to be corrected, and people took advantage of their vulnerabilities. You know, thanks so much, uh, Stryker. This this slide has a lot of uh, really important information on it. We have a lot of, there are so many statistics and numbers that are important to know. There are estimates of 6,000 uh, lives being lost. Uh, the last residential school, some people don't realize the Gordon Indian Residential School closed in 1996. Uh, you know, that is well within uh, this generation's lifetime. Uh, and the, the trauma that is experienced, some, some people who don't know any better think that we're talking about, uh, about events that were, you know, 200 years ago or 300 years ago. We're not. We're, we're talking about people who are currently in their 40s, currently in their 50s, who have gone through this, people whose parents have gone through this, and who have, uh, and who have been heavily impacted by all manners of abuse uh, that occurred. A lot of people... Um, don't even like the, the fact that the, that the name school is being used to describe the Indian residential school system. Um, because the, people have said to me, I will never call that a school. That was, that was a prison. Uh, I, the police took me away from my home. It wasn't a choice. Uh, we were beaten. We weren't allowed to speak our own language. I wasn't allowed to communicate with my siblings. Uh, you know, the, the skills that I were taught were essentially limited vocational kinds of, of training with a focus on uh, Bible and a focus on uh, uh, being good citizens for the colonial government. Um, so that wasn't a school system that had my, as, as we know school systems today, that have the interests of the child at heart uh, and the well-being of the child at heart. People say that they've never seen the, their entire, they've gone to the residential school for years, they had never seen a doctor, uh, you know, uh, and, and again, the, the, the treatment was, uh, was uh, at a minimum harsh, strict, um, and, and, and frequently uh, abusive. So I just think uh, many people find that difficult to reconcile with their understanding of this country as a tolerant, welcoming uh, nation, uh, which, which welcomes diversity. So I think we, uh, this, is, this is a part of our history that, that many Canadians don't know about and, and find uh, challenging to reconcile. And I think it's so important that people are getting more aware of this today. And this is an excellent slide to demonstrate that. Yeah, thank you very much, David. I appreciate that. And it was a very difficult thing. It's something that's going to take generations to get over because of the intergenerational harm uh, that has resulted, right, of the, all those negative experiences and how they impacted community and those communities are still healing and still trying to build back to where they were before um, all of this happened when they were strong, vibrant communities, right? But the over 6,000 um, witness statements and interviews that sort of demonstrate the, the vulnerability and the harm that was uh, uh, done to those children, they can be found at the National Research Center for Truth and Reconciliation. And I encourage people to take some time to understand the real truth of this. And there's lots of films and documentaries that bring that to light. Um, it's very disturbing. I think I've been traumatized by some of the films I've watched because it, it's too close to home for me, but I still think it's a truth that we should all have a better understanding of. So I encourage people to take some time to read more about the, the Indian residential schools and to know that it's part of their history as a part of Canada's history. But, you know, one of the things that's it's interesting is we spend so much time um, um, focusing on Indian residential schools that we don't often talk about the communities that were left behind, right? And you can imagine, and I'm a, I'm a parent, so I, this really scares the heck out of me, how would I feel after my children were things? So I'm in the yard, you know, playing with the children, doing my thing, helping to get ready for whatever season is coming up. And all of a sudden the black car and so many stories talk about the black car that came down the lane or just showed up out of nowhere, right? And, you know, a lot of children were taught to run away, right? To run into the woods and do not come back until it got dark and they knew the car wasn't there, right? This is this scary reality is the parents were powerless to stop this from happening. 
right? And, and that really had a huge impact on who they were as a person. Like how, we're, we're brought into this world, we're supposed to be protectors for our children to help build them into, into these strong individuals that will not only have a good life, but will lead our communities forward in the future. Um, and to have somebody show up and to take them away, knowing that they weren't going to come back the same children that they were leaving, right? And all the legal elements that we had, and you know, normally you would be able to go and see a lawyer, or you would fight through your through your your political power to get these back. But all those those abilities were taken away from our communities, right? And even the the way to cope with them, using ceremony and practices that we've used for thousands of years, were were forbidden, right? And we had to hide in order to have those practices. So it was a really challenging time for communities to survive. And then you think about the children uh, who went to school and came back and then became parents, right? They'd never really seen parenting, parenthood modeled, right? And suddenly they have children and, and that is a challenge for them. But then to have that black car show up again, you can imagine how that would the dread, the, the, the fear, the, 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 the huge sense of frustration about the reality. I, I just, it makes me sick inside. Yeah, uh, and I, you know, it, there's no, um, there really aren't words to describe this kind of horror uh, that families uh, must have gone through. Um, I think the, you know, for in my mind, uh, uh, one of the best ways to try to get your head around this is through the words of the survivors and the families themselves. Um, there's a documentary called Wawate, uh, W-A-W-A-H-T-E, uh, that, uh, that uh, you can find, um, you can find, I think it's on YouTube, uh, and, uh, and it just sort of uh, goes through the, uh, it's essentially the story of, uh, of, uh, of several residential school survivors. Um, uh, and uh, they talk about their experiences as well as the experiences of their families. And it's, it's only 45 minutes, but it's so powerful uh, and so emotional. And there are other examples as well. Uh, so I would just encourage people to, uh, to look for those kinds of first person accounts um, if you really want to try to get a better understanding of the impact uh, of these institutions on the lives of indigenous families and their children. Yeah, and their communities, right? And their communities, yeah. You know, the, you know, the, we there's a lot of people who talk about this time and period, and it tends to be the focal point for a lot of conversation, especially for non-indigenous people who are trying to grapple with the realities of the Indian residential school and all the harm that was done to indigenous people through different uh, policies and practices, through a lot of uh, systematic harm. Um, but what I really want people to recognize is, is that we are also a very strong and vibrant community, right? As soon as we were given the opportunity, you know, we start to see changes in the Indian Act, which sort of prevented uh, those discriminatory elements, prevented us from looking after ourselves or prevented us from having action, having the ability to take action, right? Given the right to vote, being able to start, start that process of legally demanding our rights be recognized, right? And the Supreme Court holding up those rights. That all started to happen in the 1950s. Um, and I think that we see over time this building of our, our community taking its strength back, taking its rights back, you know, exerting itself as a strong, vibrant community is a really been a long journey. And I think the TRC, you know, started out in the in the last decade and a bit. And we have seen people in Canada accept that. And, and it, it, that TRC really did something. I think society was really ready to sort of uh, reconcile with its past, right? To understand who we were as a, as a society and the harms that were done to this group of people. And we're starting to get ready, but indigenous people work for so much longer. Like this is not a new movement for us. We've been working for, for decades to sort of help create an opportunity for ourselves that, that, that to take us back to where we originally were. And I know Winona Wheeler, who's a respected scholar here at the University of Saskatchewan, talks about the five stages of decolonization. And the starting point is a strong, stable, healthy community. And the end point is a strong, stable, healthy community. And I just love the way she describes that process to us going back to where we've always been, right? That this time and period in time is a blip in our history, a tiny blip in our history. It doesn't define us, but it has impacted us. Um, but we, we are a vibrant community and we will get back to being a strong, vibrant community in the ways that we were before the residential schools came about. Absolutely. This is, um, 
This is a long narrative that has that has taken, in some ways, of course, far too long uh, to, to get here. But a lot of people are only now uh, learning about the impacts of the residential schools. And only now we're starting to see uh, 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 national and provincial and territorial organizations in psychology as well, uh, take uh, explicit uh, action-oriented stances with regard to truth and reconciliation. Uh, but this is, uh, and also in our schools, we're seeing courses that are dedicated to indigenous rights and human rights, uh, as well as equity and diversity uh, issues um, and inclusivity, of course. Um, uh, but this is a, this is a holiday uh, that has been a long time in coming. You mentioned that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, of course, that was a long time in coming. And that was a long time in coming after, uh, after the federal government's 2008 apology, which was a long time in coming. Uh, and all of these things really happened at the urging and the advocacy of uh, the indigenous community communities uh, for the most part themselves, as well as the work of some, uh, of some committed allies uh, for, for many, many years. Um, so we're part uh, of a narrative and, and, uh, and, and it continues. It's not as if uh, th this, this was uh, an era of oppression uh, and s systemic marginalization, which has ended. Uh, and uh, and which uh, which is over. It is it, the, these uh, challenges uh, and the systemic uh, challenges uh, continue. Uh, if you you know all you have to do is ask uh, if you have do, do you have access to clean drinking water. If you don't, there's a good chance you're indigenous. Uh, um, you know uh, access to healthcare, access to education. That can allow you to get into university within, you know, uh, within uh, walking or driving distance to your home. These are all barriers which continue to exist today, and I think you know this work continues to be so important. It's so it's not over by a long shot. Well, yeah, it was Murray Sinclair who said that you know it took seven seven generations to go through that process, and it'll take us seven generations to get out, right? And I, I really truly think there's a lot of truth that needs to be unpacked and it'll take generations of people to figure it all out, right? And we, we, we re witnessed that this summer, right? When we when we realized that, you know, all the harm and, and the children that were lost in residential schools, we, we had a generalization of what we thought was there. I know the indigenous community has been speaking about that for forever. Um, I, we've talked about it and, and, and it's been this thing we've known about. But I think we were really shocked when we started to see how many unmarked graves there were, and I think it 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 it, it blew our minds. Um, and I and I and I'm really excited that people are reacting with the same anger and frustration that the indigenous people have been working with for a long time. But I, I and I and it's nice for people to show up. But we had an event here at our university. Um, when the first report came out and every, almost everybody was wearing orange, right? Again, that's where that orange shirt day shows solidarity outside of that one day of year, right? And so there's this opportunity for people to wear the shirt and they were angry and frustrated and mad. And, and, I, and I appreciate that. But what's also happening is that the indigenous communities are being re-traumatized, right? Um, it's a reminder of how vulnerable we have been in this colonial problem, in this colonial country, and how we have paid the price for the ambitions of uh, of a global colonized agenda, right? And we're 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 still trying to deal with all of that, and so. I, I ask people to please be angry and be upset, but recognize that we are going through our own experience of it that is different. That you know, it is hard to realize and to be reminded how people did not value and appreciate our lives in the same way that others were appreciated and valued that were non-Indigenous. And so this last summer has been probably one of the most traumatizing summers in a long time for me because this kept, we had so many reports of how much we didn't know about those unmarked graves and the children, the lost children that desperately did not do anything wrong and yet were punished for something that had nothing to do with them. And uh, Stryker, you know, as members of the psychology profession too, we, uh, some of us who are engaged in professional practice work directly with, uh, with trauma, 
but really in the, the Canadian Psychological Association has its three pillars of research, practice, and education. And all of us work with, uh, with, with people in some capacity or another and need to understand whether it's in the classroom, uh, in our capacity as researchers or in practice, the, the capacity for re-traumatization. Um, there are so, you know, this day is, I guess, uh, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is probably the residential school system, but this day is about so much more even than that. Um, because we're talking about systemic oppression and uh, intergenerational uh, trauma, complex trauma, the 60s scoop, uh, you know, forced adoption initiatives uh, for, in, for uh, uh, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit uh, that people have experienced all kinds of marginalization uh, for generations. And, and everybody is going to have unique stories and everybody's experience is going to be a little bit different, uh, even within the same community, even within the same residential school. Uh, and uh, as people within the profession, I think we need to be very sensitive uh, of, the, of the risks that are involved in the work that we do, particularly in education, and in, uh, and in practice, but also in research. I've, you know, I've worked with people in indigenous communities who, you know, who have seen me as a researcher coming in, as a, as a person who has, uh, as a person who's really, uh, oh, I guess you're here to take something else. Now that you've taken uh, everything uh, from the land, you're here to now sort of strip my psyche of everything that could be of value to your career. Uh, and there's good reason for that because there's a history in research of that kind of research uh, that has gone on as well, that has traumatized people, even by those, and in fact, often by those who have said, I, you know, my heart is in the right place. I'm doing this for good reasons. Well, the residential schools too were, uh, were constructs of the liberal thinking at the time. Uh, so um, we have to be very aware that good intentions are not enough and, uh, and we need to be educated in cultural literacy and in uh, culturally sensitive practice, whether it's for practice, education, uh, or research within the profession of psychology. Yeah, I agree with you, David. Um, and we really need to take our time. I know um, a lot of times when I work with people who are trying to, to get on the path or try and move the, the markers that, that will support reconciliation, there's often an eagerness uh, a drive to really get there sooner than they want as quickly as possible. They do want to have a huge impact, but we're talking about some really complex issues and there's a lot of people who are, are infected by the changes that we want to make and we have to do so in a sensitive way, right? We have to recognize that we want to keep people safe in all the different ways that we can. And I think that's what Senator Murray Sinclair was talking about when he said it's going to take seven generations to build reconciliation is because we need to do this with, with compassion and kindness and generosity. And that will take time considering how horrendous and horrific the issues are that we're dealing with, you know? And it's, it's interesting, David, that you know that if you think about it, you know, when we first started this work, I don't think anybody knew what reconciliation was. And, and it, it, I don't think they still do, right? Um, do you need, did you know what reconciliation was when you started? Well, you know, it's funny, like we, 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 we talk about this, and I see on this slide here, like we talk about rec reconciliation has been a part of the language, uh, certainly in the, last, uh, in the last decade or so. Uh, when we're talking about indigenous rights uh, and human rights. But, you know, I see here, I, I like how you've got uh, re in parentheses. Like, what, what's that about? Well, you know, one of the things that's always challenging when you start a new process is, is people start looking at the language that you use, right? And the Truth and Reconciliation Commission used the term reconciliation, which became the tool that everybody sort of or the term that everybody started connecting to, right? And it's the tool that we're going to use to get ourselves forward. But when you talk to the indigenous communities, they, they, they get really frustrated at the idea that we're gonna reconcile what? Where in Canadian history have indigenous people had a positive, strong relationship with, it, with the dominant society around them so that they could go back to that place, reconciling our relationship so that we're back to that positivity. The truth is, is that we, we've never had a time. We've had moments where we've collaborated and supported each other, but there's never been 
been a time where we had a long lasting, strong, positive relationship. And so in my mind, I see it's, it is all about conciliation, right? It's about building back something that didn't exist before so that we can be in a good place. And so I recognize the term itself, reconciliation, but I also want to give emphasis that we're building something new. Right. Um, and that we're building something that isn't a threat and threat to anybody. Right. I, this the whole idea of a square peg in a round hole. Right. That isn't reconciliation. We're not hammering anybody into anything. And, and I think we've even touched on it in this conversation so far. The idea is that we have to be compassionate, generous and supportive of everybody. Right. Because reconciliation is between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. It's also within non-Indigenous people and it's also within Indigenous people because we also have our own harms and issues to work through in our own communities. But mostly we want to work towards a positive relationship between each other, right? And it will take time to get to know each other and to trust each other and to sort of learn from each other without losing ourselves in that process. Because reconciliation isn't a trend. It's not about teaching people how to be Indigenous because Indigenous people have their own worldview. Um, it really is about a bunch of recognizing us as all individuals with their own cultures and we want to come together and rather than do the forced assimilation where indigenous people become part of one group what we really want to do is like the wampum belt or the sweet grass braid is is we want to recognize these two different cultures and then if we can honor and respect each other using humility and openness and, and a positive engagement that we can build a stronger society by weaving our cultures together to support a common goal which is uh, living in harmony on this land as again as the treaties originally were meant to do we were supposed to share this land together um and and i see that path being not a, a amalgamation or a pen culturalized understanding of canada but indigenous people maintaining their culture and non-indigenous people having their own culture and together we share with each other and support each other without having to become one or the other and that is it is a new it is a new dialogue that hasn't existed. So I like what you have there, you know, the emphasis on conciliation, saying that, you know, to, uh, to, to indicate that this is, a, this is a new, this is a first uh, um, working together. This is, uh, this is a learning uh, a dialogue. You know, in, the, in the work that I do, uh, which is often primarily in uh, Western non-Indigenous organizations, you know, people will come to me with various comments and questions um, uh, because of the work that I'm involved in, um, sort of striving to be an ally and, and, and will say things and the, the intention is certainly not to, to, to be offensive, um, but there's questions like, you know, I, I understand that Indigenous people are, you know, are upset about the history, but, you know, why, why are they so angry? Um, you know, and that like people find like that anger off putting in some way. And that's, that's a discourse to be had people, I think, you know, conciliation has to do with being able to tolerate that listening to having that conversation, you know, there's conversations that need to be had. And it's about collaboration and about building relationships and listening to each other. Uh, it's the, the, the um, it's not about uh, taking away uh, or uh, minimizing the experience of people who aren't Indigenous in some way. It's about hearing, it's about walking together. It's about hearing each other. Uh, and, it's, and, and it's about moving forward in a good way, in a new way, um, uh, as you say. Um, so that's, I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, and, you know, a lot of times we talk about the harm done to Indigenous people, but again, I guess I, I showing my respect and, and appreciation for Murray Sinclair, but in a video he posted a while back, he talked about while all these harms were being done to Indigenous people, non-Indigenous people were being sold a pack of lies and mistruths about Indigenous people. So in essence, you know, colonization ha impacted both Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. And there was a lot of harm done to non-Indigenous people who were not given an opportunity to have a strong, positive relationship with Indigenous people. And, and they, that allowed for a lot of misunderstandings and truths and allows for racism to be a big part of our society because I honestly have met so many people in my life. I'm an old man now. And, and as, as that, I, I have yet to meet somebody who has ever 
had, didn't have good qualities, that didn't have the capacity for love and compassion and, and for caring, right? And, and I think that a lot of society's issues in this, around this relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people is an impact of colonization. So while we're trying to deal with this harms done to Indigenous people, we need non-Indigenous people to start looking back at their history and start looking back at the things that they were told and to recognize them as not true. Right. So this is a long process. Right. It's going to take a lot of uh, self-reflection and institutional reflection because a lot of the work that we do is embodied within institutions. So this is a long process to, uh, of unpacking, of decolonizing our society in order to understand how to build a better society that is inclusive of everybody. So if you think about that, you know, what do we do as a discipline uh, of psychology, right? It, it's a practice, right? It's, it's about action. You know, um, I, I, I put this process here, it's more of a cycle. But if you ever engaged and done the learning and acted in a way that you think is, is positive for reconciliation, David? Um, you know, I, 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 I like to think so, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the course that, uh, I think about uh, one of the elders who we uh, meet with in the, I, I, I teach this course at, at the University of Guelph Humber on, um, on indigenous knowledge uh, and mental health. And we travel routinely uh, once a year, other than this most recent COVID years, uh, to uh, Meshkegawak territory, to Moosini and, and Moose Factory, uh, and have the opportunity to meet with elders and knowledge keepers in the community and also learn, uh, you know, have the, have the opportunity to learn from elders and really participate in some cultural activities. Uh, and we, and, and it's also an opportunity for us to act and to, uh, and to try to make uh, a, a difference and contribute in ways that are needed. Um, uh, but what's really interesting to me here, uh, Stryker, on this slide is you have, in, and I think it's something that has come up in the context of the course that, that in, the, in the way the learning happens with the elders when we're in community, but I want to ask you about this. You have engage first and then learn, uh, which I think to, uh, to many of us seems like, wouldn't you learn first and then engage? Uh, and and uh, so I just wanted to ask you about that. Yeah, well, this is part of the process is when you come from the, the dominant culture, when you have all the power and privilege, right, um, there, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of fears, and we, maybe we should talk about that next. There's a lot of fears, and people tend to sort of get stuck in the learning phase as, it, as if they learn enough, eventually those fears will dissipate and they'll feel confident and strong. And so what I always encourage is that you engage, and I don't mean just engage with Indigenous people, I mean engage with the idea of reconciliation recognizing that we have come from a history that didn't serve our communities, all of our communities well, and that we need to revisit how we understand ourselves. And then more importantly, how we act that new re re revelation about inclusivity and diversity. How do we act that out? Right. And I think that's the starting point. Once you've committed and made that engagement with the idea of reconciliation, then the learning becomes naturally much more productive because it feeds who you are, where you're at, where you're going, right? And also gives you direction on how to act. I think when we, when we, when we, you put learning first, too many people get stuck in that beginning stage and they don't necessarily move forward uh, or they wait until they feel right. And that gives them a lot of opportunity because they're in a power and privileged position, but it doesn't change anything for indigenous people in Canada. It allows them to feel safe and secure while we have to continue to deal with the oppression uh, that's put on us in all the different ways and all the different institutions in Canada. So I really start with an action piece followed by learning and then back to act. And as I said before, it's a cycle. You know, how many times have I gone and done something and then learned something deeper as my, in my second or third or fourth uh, circle around that issue? Um, it's a learning process. It's a continuous learning practice. It's not a one-way street where we learn, we engage, we learn, and then we do it and we're done. This is a continuous cycle, just like the seasons. And I guess it's challenging, Stryker, because I, I see here at the top the question uh, of, you know, what can the discipline of psychology do, you know? So as we talk about the discipline of psychology engaging and learning and acting, I guess one concern that people have is, you know, am I going to... Uh, 
am I going to, um, to be too much of a burden on the indigenous community if I try to engage with this? You know, should I reach out to a friendship center? To, should I reach out to an elder? Like, am I going to be imposing, like, do people have time to deal with these questions? Um, you know, so I think people sometimes get a little bit nervous, uh, particularly I think in the, with, within psychology, this is a question that comes to me frequently about, you know, how do I start? How do I engage? But I see that, you know, you've appropriately already put up the next slide, which I think, uh, which I think is, is part of this. Well, yeah, and we talked about this, a lot of what people or what causes hesitation for a lot of people who really do want uh, who have good intentions um, is is that they they have to manage their fears, right? You said describe making mistakes or where to start. You know, some people are worried about wasting time if they don't get it right the first time. Um, they, they, you know, the insulting cultural cult, uh, cultures and everything like that. There are a lot of fears that drive people's hesitancy, and we have to acknowledge these fears. I think these fears emerge out of uh, a lot of the colonization and how it hampered and harmed them, right? It's created this opportunity for colonization to continue because it created this uncertainty that people have to navigate. You know, we've both, me and you have done this for a long time. We've both heard many people, different ways in which people talk about why I haven't done much yet. I intend to, I'm going to, I really care about this. I see the importance of it, all these things. But, you know, I'm often interacting with people and they're saying, you know, I'm just too busy, maybe later or right. I, like you said earlier, we don't know enough. Right. And the fear of making mistakes. Right. As if you're, you're you know, I, I said this to a colleague once and I did it with love. And I said, if your ego is too important to do the right thing, then what are we talking about here? And that person really had this strong reaction and they realized that they were putting themselves above and, be, and, and ahead of all the indigenous peoples in Canada. Right. We need to really start thinking about this and having humility, but really in, in order to get us started, we have to recognize that there are a lot of concerns and fears that people have. If you ever had an issue or a time where you felt uh, fear or you felt hesitancy or you had that moment where you started wondering whether you should be doing this? Well, Stryker, I, I live in fear. I w <laughs> I'll tell you. Oh my God. David, you're the nicest guy I know. I <laughs> There have, there's lots, there's lots of times this work is messy work. This, this work is work that has to do with ne that is necessarily about reaching outside of your comfort zone. Um, this work is necessarily about being off balance and about communicating that you don't have all the answers and reaching out to uh, people with a different cultural background and different life experiences and engaging in that conversation where you might say something wrong or you, you don't know uh, exactly what the right thing to say is. And of course, I, I always, uh, the, the one thing that I adhere to is really a not knowing approach, um, uh, you know, and no matter how much I learn, uh, I really feel most comfortable uh, having the stance of, you know, I can never under, fully understand your experience. Um, that's a very individual thing. And, uh, and sometimes, you misstep, or I should say more correctly, I misstep. Um, uh, one time, uh, uh, for example, I was introduced and I always start talking about my not knowing approach. And that is usually my, you know, my, my opener. But at one point I was introduced and, and somebody gave me a very flattering introduction. And I was, you know, I'm not, I was a little, I guess, in, insecure. I, and I and I ran with that, uh, and 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 you know the person asked me to sort of like uh, um, uh, ex express my experience, and I went through my list of of things that I had done with regard to uh, to working within indigenous communities, and it, the, the, it, it, you've done this. Sorry, striker. I was just saying that's a long list. It must have taken you an hour. Ah. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't that long but what it did do was the people who were indigenous in the room i think it made them sort of raise an eyebrow and and say well you know do you do you really see yourself as an expert of indigenous knowledge and wisdom and of course i don't but somehow i think my introduction came out that way as if i was you know so, sort of a person who knew all things and the people who were indigenous in the room i feel like um sort of took it upon themselves to demonstrate that I was not an expert uh, and to sort of point out that I had a lot to learn. 
which I know I do. Um, but somebody might have interpreted that, like you say here, uh, Indigenous people don't like me. It was a tough, it, I will say this, it was a tough room. Uh, it was not my favorite, uh, my favorite um, uh, discourse. Uh, it was not my favorite day. But I, 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 I believe I understand something about what it was about. Um, and it had to do with humility. And it had to do with humility and, I, uh, and, and respect, for, uh, respect for knowing what you don't know. Uh, knowing that there that there are limits to your knowledge and and respecting the uh, the experience, particularly the the tra traumatic experiences and the challenges that you can't know, um, and uh, and so I guess uh, that I hope that 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 didn't take us too far afield. But what but the, the point is is that I can understand it's a legitimate uh, reaction to be afraid. To uh, to be worried, to get stuck at the starting line, as you say here, uh, and to be afraid of misstepping. And it's if you're doing this work, it's inevitable that I think that it will happen. It's I'm sure it's going to happen to me again. Um, but it's also part of you know uh, it being able to accept that this work uh, is Im is imperfect, and we are necessarily living in the sort of gray area of yeah. communication. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And, and I'll be honest, I, I, even I make mistakes and I'm fearful of making mistakes. And uh, I think it really sort of gives me a perspective on what humility is all about. But really the driving factor I have is, is, is we need to go through this, this unknown space. We, this fear of the unknown cannot be driving us, um, that we need to embrace it and find it together. And I think that's the beauty of working together is, is that we can make mistakes, but we can learn or be supporting and lifting each other up to help find the next step or the next path. And that's really a big part of it. But so often um, what I recognize is, is that so many people um, they let the fear of the unknown really drive their hesitancy and their lack of engagement with the actions of reconciliation. Um, I do know that, the, you know, this idea of the fear of the unknown, that we have our researcher here in the University of Regina that talks about this and does a great job, uh, Carlton. It, and he talks about this as being one of the, well, I guess he talks about this as being one of the primary fears, the building fear that really creates an opportunity for people to try to avoid negative consequences, right? Um, and to trying to, un to dealing with the unknown, right? If you think about it, even children or babies at the age of four months have a fear of the unknown, right? They have a hesitancy, right? And they need their parents or somebody around them. And it's the community that really helps to keep people safe, right? So fear of the unknown is a really driving factor in a lot of people, right? And it, it's, a, it's an enormous part of what we're doing here when we're talking today is, is help trying to paint a picture for people so that we can alleviate some of those fears. But I just wanna point out another thing that's really important is, is that we're not all the same, right? Some people have a greater fear of the unknown than others. And some people have a better tolerance for uncertainty. You know, I have met people who, who embrace the uncomfortableness of not knowing what's gonna come next or not knowing whether they've done the right thing. And they, they, they teach it, they, they treat it like a learning experience. They know that they might have got it wrong, but whatever result, they're going to learn from it and they're going to do it better next time. And, and those people are really, uh, I'm, I'm inspired by those people. They really have a better way of, they have a really good way of coping with that uncertainty. But that doesn't mean everybody does, right? We've both met people who are a little bit more rigid or we have a really strong structured world uh, around them or a worldview. And it's important for them to have that understanding. And so they are, they need a little bit more security. They need a little bit more support. They need to be supported to understand that they have control, that they don't need to escape and run away from a threat, that this is a slow engaged process. It's going to take a long time and we need to honor them. Right. And, and by doing that, we really should nurture the kindness and generosity that we want our society to have. Right. And so there is no starting point. There is no path that leads us to reconciliation that everybody has to follow. There are multiple paths to that place. What really is important is people get on the path and they get past that starting point and they find their way to learn and engage and support each other. Um, I'm just going to, you know, I'm just thinking of all of this. And, and, and part of what is really important for us to understand is is, is, you know, it has to come back to the fact is, is that cultures play a role in our society, 
Mm -hmm. um, culture is that sort of that process of, of every citizen being in culture to an understanding that creates cohesion for a group. And that group or collective programming allows for less conflict and it increases our survivability. When everybody can think and does think in a similar way, then we navigate problems and challenges with more security and more uh, cohesion, we're much more likely to end up in a good place. Um, and that is the role of culture, right? This is what Hofstede and Schwartz teach us about in their research and, the, and it's an interesting area. But one of the things that Schwartz brought out recently was the idea that those values and world beliefs that we have aren't actually held by citizens. They're actually held by the institutions that we work in. And as we interact with those institutions, it teaches us how to behave, what is, what is preferred versus what is not preferred. And it helps guide and shape us into the citizens that create a stability for our society. And that is important for stability. But what happens though is, is when you're enculturated into one worldview, especially a dominant worldview, you stop seeing culture in other people. You start wondering why people don't understand these are the truths that we have to have. Um, and these are the truths that lead to the right conclusions and the right solutions to our issues that we want to overcome and that are challenging us. So when we think about it that way, institutions play a huge role. And when you think about the discipline of psychology, it's grown up in institutional settings. It actually serves a lot of the same purposes. We've created this idea that our world, the knowledge that we have, really has been structured and functioned and positioned in a Western paradigm. Don't you think you agree, David? Yeah, I mean, it's this, uh, this the same period uh, that has sort of given rise to this, to, to colonization is really the, the period in which the, the field of psychology has developed, uh, um, you know, and I, I sometimes, you know, refer to that old adage, you know, the fish is the last to discover water. Uh, and, uh, and, and the, 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 the culture is really, is both the, the context in which we are embedded and also the sort of the project that we have of the, the change project that we have in front of us, um, you know, and so it's a, it's, it's, it's an interesting time that, that we are in, but it is also uh, not at all surprising that our healthcare system, psychology, uh, specifically uh, our educational system as, as um, uh, really as outgrowths, as, as creations uh, of, the, uh, of a Western uh, philosophical system has not been uh, particularly kind or welcoming um, or suitable for a lot of uh, indigenous people uh, or for indigenous people. Uh, and, and we see this in Canada and we see it around the world, um, you know, and really this is a cultural a cultural issue and it's a challenging one to then uh, through a reflective gaze to identify uh, because uh, it's just it's so much part of our values uh, and our perspective um, so I think that's that's part of the challenging work that we have before us is to be able to identify that which is has a tendency to become invisible Exactly. And, and this is why I think it's really important that we recognize that the path towards reconciliation um, really involves both personal and professional development, right? When you think about the, the, the culture and how it has informed us, that software of the mind in which we use it as a tool for understanding what's happening around us and, and to, to limit that, that uncertainty to increase our understanding of the path forward and how our futures will unfold, right? For the dominant society that was gifted to them it wasn't something that they went out to build it was just something that they had like you said the fish in the water just didn't have a clue that it was in the water it just knew it was there and it was doing what it was doing right and so i i really believe that a lot of the work that we need to do starts with a personal understanding of us as individuals who are cultured right um and when we think about this um i i think we need to know yourself right you need to know your positionality right we need to know that we are cultured identities, that we anticipate and acknowledge and understand the world around us with a certain paradigm, right? And that sometimes doesn't allow us to see the differences or when we do see the differences, we see them as challenges or obstacles rather than as a different way of seeing the world that might actually have odd advantages. 
once you start to take that pro process towards um, unpacking this cultured world that we live in, you start to see that there are perspectives out there and that we can take different perspectives and taking different perspectives is a huge part of our university and research and the work we do in psychology is, is recognizing and valuing the different pers perspectives and how they add to our truth and understanding of the world around us, right? Yet the key in that process though, when you take that, uh, that personal perspective, you start to understand that there are multiple perspectives out there is that you have to slow down that, that non, that, that judgmentalness, right? Oftentimes when we, when we encounter something that doesn't make sense to us, we get really quick to judge and, and judging creates a, a, a loss of opportunity to learn together. Um, and so I, I really think that we need to approach this and engage with people. We need to recognize that it's a challenging experience when you start to deal with other cultures and that you don't understand and that people will approach the same situation with different intentions or ideas about what that looks like. That happens, right? And that's all about knowing yourself in relation to other people. But once you start to do that, then you can know your space. You can have the opportunity to build inclusivity. And that involves, you know, that cultural awareness. And then you start to build up your sensitivity of other cultures. You start to recognize the cultured spaces, the multicultural spaces that we live in. And you build that up that understanding and you start to build on it so that you can act in different ways that are inclusive of everybody around you rather than just prioritizing or benefiting those who think similar to you, right? That's building up that cultural competency, which then allows you to create cultural safety for everyone, where everybody can have their own cultural perspective and they can exist in our society and, and have opportunities that everybody has without penalizing them for having or being different cultures or having different cultures. And I think that that allows us and that these, these two first steps here will allow us to build relationship with reconciliation. Because like I said, this is a journey that's going to take generations to get through and to arrive at. We need to build up a relationship that's strong and vibrant. You know, we have to move past just making safe spaces. We have to know who we are in relation to Indigenous people, right? And we have to take those steps towards doing it. And that's all about a journey, right? It's about you taking the time and taking, dedicating your life and the processes mm -hmm. and the opportunities that you have to learning and growing. And really probably one of the most important things is to have fun. You know, Indigenous people, when I spend time with them, we laugh and joke about everything. It's always an enjoyable moment when we get together and we share in the trials and tribulations of our work or in the, 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 the excitements of who we are and where we come from and where we're going. There's always humor, right? So enjoy the journey of reconciliation because when you engage in learning, it should be fun. It should be something that excites you and creates curiosity. And when you do that, when you have that really positive relationship with reconciliation, then you start to impact people around you. That's when you get to share your journey, share the experiences. And I've seen you do that so many times, David. You have this, this enormous positive relationship that you, you're infectious, right? People are attracted to the way in which you engage in reconciliation and the excitement that it gives you. And, and that excitement in your excitement really helps them to move past their fears, right? Move past all those hesitancies that stop them from really getting on the path and embracing the lifelong journey that's going to lead forward. So I just want to honor you because everything I've spoken to, I, I, I think I've seen you um, um, act out in so many different ways. I really think that you're uh, an example of what having a good relationship with reconciliation is all about, David. Well, thanks so much, Stryker. I mean, and, and in turn, it's like you, uh, other colleagues like uh, Roger John talking about positionality. Roger always talks about um, self-locating on the path toward reconciliation. And I mean, that's really the, the, um, the opportunity that I've had is really to learn from, uh, from people like yourselves who are able to help me with seeing that, um, th with doing that, engaging in that reflective piece. I mean, you, you know, my, my, my training and background in psychology, I think is like that of many, which is, you know, the, the primarily Western focused um, and, uh, 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 you know, primarily uh, natural scientific positivistic paradigm. Uh, these are the research methods that you need. I mean, I don't know that anybody ever said these are the re research methods that you need, but the sort of implicit message in grad school or even in undergrad was we're going to give you the foundations. Uh, we're going to give you the tools that you need to do your work. And, you know, in part of my experience was uh, when I when I 
you know, years ago started working with, with indigenous peoples. Um, no, nope, I didn't. I, I thought I had a really, I thought I had really good, I went to a, a good grad school. I had good clinical training, but I didn't feel like I was properly equipped. And, um, and, and, and I, you know, knowing these approaches to psychotherapy, knowing these approaches to, uh, to treatment, knowing these approaches to assessment, to diagnosis, these approaches to research, um, they, they weren't enough. They weren't, and, and they weren't enough, not because I needed a, f a few more, uh, but they, 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 they weren't, uh, they, they, they did not fit culturally um, with the, the work that I was doing. And I recognized that I needed more information. I needed help. I needed help from indigenous community members to help me see what I couldn't see, wh which was why my training was insufficient. And I think that's, uh, I think as a, as a field, I think we need to continue to engage in that work. That's not over for me, uh, not by a long shot. And I know it's not over for the field. Um, so, uh, you know, this, what we're really doing now, I think is a starting point. And I see you have this next, so speaking of starting points, um, do you mind Stryker if I go into this a little bit? Please do. I just want to acknowledge that the journey through graduate uh, graduate schools is difficult, and and I just wanted to say that when I went through grad school, I actually had a moment there where the the service and the work that I want to do with my community was not was in juxtaposition to the requirements of me getting my PhD, uh, and it, it was tearing me apart because at a time where I was starting to feel my strength as an Indigenous man and feel confident that I was going to be able to help support my communities suddenly the, the, the expectations of the degree itself were in disalignment um, to who I was. And I, it just almost tore me apart. And I've heard so many stories of indigenous people who have struggled through grad schools, they get closer to the destination, you know, and that's a, it's a huge travel, it's a huge journey to be able to go through that and find who you are at the end still intact. Some of us don't. Um, so I agree, it, it's a challenge in so many different ways. And I really love the fact that our profession, uh, the field of psychology is moving in a new direction. And thank you for that, Stryker. In particular for people who identify as indigenous within, uh, within the Western university system, um, uh, indigenous people, I think, um, uh, risk something that, uh, that Euro Canadians do not, um, uh, because the epistemology, uh, and this will get into sort of where where we're going here, uh, but because of the 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 way that we are taught in the universities may be different from what people the way that people learn culturally, and the the ways of knowing uh, may be different, and the assumptions uh, of the field with regard to what is worth being knowable. Uh, and, and what kind of knowledge should be taken seriously and what kind of knowledge should we sort of roll our eyes at. Um, as an Indigenous person who has to sit in the class, um, th there, are, there, there are things that exactly as you say are juxtaposed with, with who, you, who your identity is and what you want to do and the kind of knowledge that you've gained uh, to this point. So you risk something of yourself. Uh, in a way that others do not. And I think that as educators, uh, you know, for example, in psychology, we need to be very aware of that, uh, of that issue. And in fact, we've, we haven't been great uh, at it. And so, um, you know, uh, again, as we said, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, uh, report, uh, uh, or the truth uh, closing ceremonies uh, happened in, uh, in 2015, really at the same time as only a few blocks away, the Canadian Psychological Association Convention was, uh, was ongoing uh, in 2015 from June 4th to 6th. I remember because at the time I was chair of the Indigenous Peoples section, at the time the Aboriginal Psychology section, and, uh, and, and, and uh, myself and others composed a, a letter uh, at the time, ad addressing the need to uh, to talk about um, uh, th this this report uh, in light of uh, of the National um, uh, Psychology Organization in Canada, 
uh, and the convention. And a short time later, uh, I was invited to chair this task force uh, to address psychology's response to the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission of Canada's report. And, and we felt that it was important to start out with an apology and to discuss uh, uh, our breach of ethics. Uh, and then um, to, from that apology and from that discussion of our breach of ethics, follow uh, some general guiding principles. Uh, for working with Indigenous peoples in Canada. And these are general, that uh, these, these guiding principles should be relevant. We think they're relevant, no matter what particular area within the field of psychology you're working in. But then we also tried uh, as a group, and I think there was 17 of us or so in this, in this group comprised of Indigenous community members and people within psychology and mental health. Uh, but we also, uh, um, uh, try to provide guiding principles for specific areas within the discipline. Um, but you can, uh, if you Google, uh, or if any, anybody wants to see, learn more, and certainly encourage that people do, if you just Google uh, CPA uh, and uh, TRC, uh, CPA and TRC, you'll uh, find our, uh, our actual full report. And I really encourage everybody uh, to, to read it. Um, yeah. So uh, I guess we can start with uh, professional ethics uh, as as really as a starting point, uh, and this is as as we discussed already that 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 psychology in Canada developed in the same political uh, climate and colonial context as the residential school system, and you know we have four uh, four main principles uh, in our uh, in our code of ethics: respect for the rights uh, and dignity of persons and people, responsible caring, integrity and relationships, and relationships, uh, and sorry, and responsibility to society. So very briefly, I'll just mention that historically, so with regard, for example, to the rights and dignity of persons and people, that historically the profession of psychology has failed to respect the rights and dignity of indigenous peoples by failing to acknowledge the social injustice of over a century of federal policy aimed at the eradication of indigenous culture and peoples through the residential, residential schooling, for example, and forced adoption initiatives is another example. Responsible caring. In, uh, in relying on methods and epistemologies that are foreign and potentially harmful to indigenous peoples in Canada, much of the care that has been provided has not been grounded in appropriate cultural understandings that include indigenous concepts of self or indigenous concepts of health and illness or indigenous views of the family or indigenous cultural values. So we haven't been providing responsible caring in that way. And integrity in relationships. This is the ethical principle that mandates that in providing treatment in their particular areas of competence, psychologists in Canada are called upon to evaluate how their quote, experiences, attitudes, culture, belief, values, individual difference, individual differences, specific training, external pressures, personal needs, and historical, economic, and political context might influence their activities. So as a discipline, uh, even though uh, there may be a, a handful of psychologists who had done that, uh, as a discipline, psychology has not done this in relation to Indigenous peoples in Canada. And with regard to responsibility to society, psychology as a discipline, again, has not demonstrated respect for the social structures of indigenous communities in Canada that have evolved since time immemorial. Uh, our approaches to assessment and treatment have not been normed or validated in partnership with indigenous populations. Assessments that don't necessarily uh, acknowledge or draw from indigenous epistemologies have caused unnecessary disruption to already marginalized family and community structures. Psychological tools that are inappropriate have been used to support discriminatory policies that pathologize uh, indigenous peoples, as well as practices that are neither just nor beneficial to indigenous communities in Canada, for example, forced adoption. These behaviors fail indigenous communities and thus are irresponsible to Canadian society as a whole. So, 
these, so these are ways in which we have contravened our own code of ethics in psychology with regard to indigenous people in Canada. All right, uh, you couldn't have said it better, David. Um, I, I really love this, this LID of uh, that we've contravened our own code of ethics because it gives us a starting point, right? Because our code of ethics is such an important part of our profession and our field of psychology. And I love the idea that we can start here by trying to bring that back, get integrity in the way that we've always thought we had integrity, but that we needed to build it up better. So I appreciate that. And so if we recognize that we've contra contravened our code of ethics, then obviously that's sort of the starting point for a, an apology, right? Yeah, and that exactly sort of takes us to our, our, uh, our official apology um, and uh, our apology to Indigenous peoples um, really uh, uh, based on this. It, if, 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 if you accept that we have contravened our own code of ethics and notice by the way, that it's not our code of ethics that is the problem. The, the code of ethics is telling us to do really, uh, to have really good behavior uh, here, um, but, but we haven't done it. Um, and, and, and it's interesting how that sort of that that occurred uh, over the years, but as, as if it was sort of an unwritten or an unspoken exception that for remote and indigenous communities, it was just the same standards don't apply. Nobody said that. Oh, I, I love what you, David, I think that you just hit a teachable moment here. And I love that is that there's nothing wrong with the code of ethics. It is that we interpreted them within a very narrow focus that benefited a very specific group of people. And what we really need to do is re-narrate what we thought we meant by them so that they become inclusive and supportive of a diverse community of people in Canada. And, and that's what I think some people are fearful of when they think about indigenization, decolonization, reconciliation. They think that the process is a teardown and a rebuild from scratch. And what we're not, we're not actually doing that. We, as a society, I think we have a lot of strengths and benefits and gifts to everybody, but somehow we sort of benefited one group of people. And we really have to recognize that we can actually reinterpret those values, those ethics and shape them so that they support everybody. And by doing so, we actually become the profession that we've always dreamed of being the goal of always it's always been to be a big positive part of society, right? To support the mental health and well-being of people in Canada. And that includes the indigenous peoples in Canada, right? And so I just love that, that, that you've stated that in the way that you did. Well, thanks, Drucker. I think it's, it's, I think it's uh, for those of us within, you know, the varied uh, aspects of, of the field of psychology, I think we, for the most part, thought that we were adhering to the ethical standards. And so what, what we in our report are, are bringing to people is the, the, the ethical standards are, are good ones and, and, the, uh, and everybody's beliefs uh, are, are good beliefs, uh, but, but we have failed indigenous peoples. Okay. Um, and David, I'm gonna ask you to uh, actually, do you mind if I ask you to read out the apology? Cause I think it's worth saying it word for word. Sure, so I'll, I'll, this is the, the formal apology. As we acknowledge a failure to meet our own ethical standards, the profession of psychology in Canada must also acknowledge our history of having caused harm toward Indigenous peoples. We acknowledge that these failings have roots as far back as the development of this profession in Canada. We apologize for not opposing discriminatory governmental policy. We apologize for colluding with policies and laws that have promoted the marginalization and oppression of Indigenous peoples. We apologize for grounding our approaches to assessment and treatment in epistemologies and research that have little relevance to Indigenous peoples. We apologize for the lack of acknowledgement of cultural and historical contexts of Indigenous peoples in Canada in our professional work and our failure to name the unjust impacts of our governmental policies on Indigenous peoples. As a profession, we have a strong commitment to healing in ways that are empirically supported. We have been biased, irresponsible, and disrespectful to Indigenous peoples in Canada in the manners described here. We apologize for failing to be supportive allies and advocates to Indigenous peoples. So, uh, you know, that, that apology 
uh, I think, uh, is one that, that a number of us worked on and it really comes out of a recognition of the uh, failings with regard to the code of ethics uh, and to the and to the history of and, and to the to the lived experiences uh, and the evidence that we are that we have heard from people in their interaction with the field um, uh, over the years. Uh, I think we have another statement of apology here, uh, and that is an uh, apology to indigenous psychologists allies and advocates who've worked with indigenous peoples in Canada. We failed to support and recognize you and the difficult and challenging work that you've taken up. And I guess this is to recognize that over the years, there have been those people uh, who have, you know, uh, have sort of swam against the tides or against the current or whatever metaphor you want to use and who have been uh, voices um, where, you know, at a time that people did not really sort of recognize these issues. Uh, and so those were people who could have used support and their positions could have used bolstering. Uh, and so uh, we're, we're, we're trying to do that better now, but the, the, those are people who uh, also um, we apologize to uh, uh, for not being, uh, not being greater supports to them. Stryker, is there anything you want to add to that? I just I know that we, uh, when we were discussing this apology that we added the Indigenous psychologists, I think we both have worked with a lot of brilliant, um, dedicated, caring people who have really worked hard throughout their entire careers to help the field of psychology better understand what was missing. Um, and I don't think they necessarily were, at the time, appreciated and valued, and a lot of them really had to deal with the circumstances that just sort of didn't really, they were ahead of their time um, and the work wasn't recognized about it. So I know me and you purposely put this in because we wanted to acknowledge them. And I know so many indigenous psychologists, I've met so many over the years that I've been doing this work and they are a, a brilliant dedicated group of people. And I just wanna honor them and all that they've done to help us all be here today because without their work, Many of us, we'd be so far, we wouldn't be even close to the starting line. We'd all be trying to figure out what uniform to wear. So I appreciate the fact that they've done this so much work for us. And I just want to acknowledge them right now. Marcy. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely, Stryker. Okay, so let's, if people are ready to accept that apology, David, and they're ready to get going, so get us started. Just give us a quick overview on, on the principles, the guiding principles that they can use to help get engaged and to do good work. Sure, thanks, Stryker. I, you know, we don't have a lot of time uh, remaining, and I don't want to. I don't want to bore people with going into too much detail here. So again, I'll just say, if you look up the CPA TRC Task Force report, you can find all of this in 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 greater detail. But here we have the six general guiding principles that we proposed that uh, are really relevant to those who are involved in the field of psychology in general, and it really shouldn't matter uh, what particular work you're doing within psychology. It's not just about practice or research or, uh, uh, or education, for example. Uh, these are general guiding principles. So the first is cultural allyship. And this is the idea that psychologists and people involved in the profession in Canada are really called upon to stand with Indigenous people rather than simply knowing about them. This is the, uh, the idea of learning about cultural safety and literacy, understanding indigenous epistemologies, learning about the role of ceremony, traditions, uh, indigenous spirituality, as well as learning about like on holidays like today, the impacts of colonization, the residential school system, uh, system uh, the uh, 60 scoop, and in engaging in training in deconstructing the cultural assumptions of mainstream psychology. And, it's not that we have to tear apart all of psychology. It's, it, it, it has to do rather with learning about those things that we have been taught, which, which hinder as opposed to which illuminate. Um, so so when, when the things that we've been taught in grad school limit the things that we can learn and understand and know, maybe it's time to evaluate whether or not those things are being helpful to us. So that's cultural allyship. Humility, 
psychologists, again, have been trained in particular ways of knowing. Uh, and typically, uh, for us, ways of knowing that are foreign to our training, we see as maybe less valid. Uh, whether or not providing treatment or engaging in research or assessment, uh, those in the discipline should be guided by humility. So this is the idea of approaching traditional knowledge with, uh, with respect and a, a spirit of genuine learning and collaboration. And that leads us to our next point, really, collaboration. <clears throat> this is uh, that the work that we do should not be the product um, of something that just happens independently that we then try to pitch or get buy-in or uh, from, from the indigenous community, but rather they should be uh, from the ground up, uh, products of community collaboration and ongoing uh, discourse. Um, initiatives should be the result of planning with community members and leaders, elders and healers. And, and I think about this, um, I had a professor, uh, Connie Fisher, who used to ask the question of, you know, uh, for whose sake, who, who benefits from this intervention? Who benefits from this research? Who benefits from this service? Uh, so we need to ask ourselves, you know, when we're doing this uh, in this way, who benefits and for whom is this? And is this approach to assessment, treatment, data collection, analysis, is, is this the best way to, uh, to examine this, this particular thing? Or this, is this the best way to engage this community in this particular way? You know? uh, and, and there needs to be an opportunity for community members to provide feedback to psychologists regarding the degree to which that an intervention or uh, an initiative was helpful or culturally appropriate. And, 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 and give feedback for how these services could be improved. This feedback loop is a critical aspect to the work that we do. The time has long passed for psychology to sort of do something without getting feedback and to just sort of continue because that was what we were trained to do in grad school. That's how we continue, that, that is the path for continuing uh, ethical transgressions. Uh, what we need to do is move toward bridging Western and indigenous uh, cultures and making efforts to understand uh, another's cultural worldview uh, and trying to arrive at shared agreements and understanding. And that's part of the work of uh, the fourth uh, item is critical reflection. So it's really incumbent upon us to be able to uh, self-locate, to, uh, to identify where you are in terms of your particular path on uh, place on the path toward reconciliation. What is the role of your credentials uh, and your ancestors and your family's role in colonization? Um, when we're working with indigenous uh, peoples, as I mentioned, we may need to unlearn some of the training uh, that, that we had uh, at those times that it restricts uh, uh, are uh, the, the, the possibilities that are that lie ahead uh, of us. And respect. Uh, th this is, we use the term respect to, de to denote not only uh, that we should have respect for the specific people uh, with whom we work uh, as representatives of the field, but also uh, for the indigenous culture that has been resilient and survived, as well as all of that, having respect for all of that knowledge and wisdom, which sadly uh, has been lost through, uh, through initiatives like the residential school system, that, that th those, those connections, those, um, the language, the traditions that, that, have, that are gone, never, never to return. Uh, we need to respect that, um, you know, and we need to respect that um, when we engage in our work with Indigenous people, we're at much greater risk for misunderstanding, misconstruing, mistreating, misdiagnosing Indigenous clients. And, and we, need, we need to really understand that risk. Um, research, treatment, assessment, and programs are needed 
for example, in indigenous languages, in part because language connects indigenous peoples to their land, traditions, worldviews, and future well being. So, having respect for the role of language in transmitting culture and having respect for culture in addressing the harms of colonization and in healing the, uh, the, the damage done by colonial forces, uh, particularly for a people who have sustained intergenerational um, wounding uh, from attempts from these kinds of uh, meth, um, um, systemic uh, uh, systemic efforts to eradicate their culture. So, so culture in itself is healing, and we need to have a respect for that uh, as a profession. And lastly, social justice. Uh, we need to strive uh, for greater understanding of the social justice context. Uh, when providing services uh, in general. Um, as I mentioned before, the idea of who will benefit from particular, uh, from particular approaches needs to be understood by those who are providing it, as well as uh, a, 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 reflect, a reflection about, uh, we need to be reflective about uh, the vulnerability, the power dynamics, trust, the historical impact that the profession of psychology has had on a population. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we, there's, a, there's a lot that we can do in terms of thinking about and acting on the social justice aspects of the work that we do. Um, so those really are uh, some, general, uh, some general guiding principles. Stryker, I've been talking for a while. Uh, David, <laughs> this is really important to you. So I, I really appreciate you going into the detail to help other people understand. And I, even when you speak, I can hear you blending Western and indigenous ideas into it so that you're talking from a really inter strong intercultural space. So I respect what you're doing and what you were saying there. I think people are gonna benefit from all of that knowledge. Thank you. And you know it's interesting because when you think about it, when we're going to take those guiding principles, they can be applied to all these different areas within psychology. Um, I know a lot of people think that this is something that has to be addressed at a, at a clinical or a practice level, um, but really, if you think about it, it can be a, it can be addressed in all the different fields that we have within psychology, right? The assessment, treatment, research, education, training, program development, program evaluation, and like you said at the end there, advocacy and social justice. So. There is, there is no way in which people can't get involved in supporting reconciliation and recognizing the journey that we're going. And at some point in time, we all have to find our way onto this path because that is where we're going in Canada. That is the future, don't you agree? Absolutely. And I, I wish we had the time to, to go into the guiding principles for the specific areas. Again, I refer people to the full document of our report uh, for that. But we did as a group. Uh, uh, come up with guiding principles to assist um, a, a little bit. And again, this is not a solution. This is a first step. This is a, you know, this, this report is really, a, there is so much work that, that, that we need to do with regard to really all of these areas. Um, uh, but of course we can't do it here, but, uh, but, the, but, but th there are uh, important areas uh, uh, that are specific um listed here so well thank you very much and i appreciate that we did all this work that we had such a an amazing group of people that came together who who helped build a pathway forward for the field of psychology and they were so um engaged with enthusiasm and curiosity that they really were able to find an enormous amount of pathways into this for everybody um, and, and that's just the inclusive approach in which this team came together to develop that report. And uh, I hope everybody takes the time to read it, to explore it. And I know that this is going to be a living document that will evolve over time and that we will add to it. And as our understanding deepens, as we learn more, um, we will add to this document and we will help build a field of psychology that benefits everybody in Canada, including the Indigenous peoples of Canada. 
So um, I just want to say that, you know, in preparation for this, uh, this presentation we did today, um, I, I was I was thinking about it and somebody threw a quote at me and I, I actually realized that this is kind of a quote that summarizes in some ways reconciliation for me. So I'm just going to read it out loud because I think it's so clear and it's definitely not my quote. It's Martin Luther King came up with this idea and it says that all this is simply to say that all life is interrelated. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. And, and, I, and I love this. It's so clear and it, it embeds the idea that we can live together and share this land in a way that we always intended through those treaty negotiations. So uh, I think that's the path forward. And I invite everybody in Canada and especially the psychologists who are interested in supporting an inclusive and diverse society to take this message and to live with it and grow with it and to share it with other people. David, I'll give you the last words. R.C. Stryker, I just want to thank you uh, and uh, uh, for uh, it's a pleasure as always to work with you um, uh, on the uh, on our task force on our you know the work in the CPA Indigenous Peoples section and today on this presentation. Uh, thanks so much. Also want to thank uh, CPA for recognizing the importance of having a, 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 a presentation like this and uh, commemorating this new National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. And lastly, I'd really like to thank anybody who uh, is a viewer or a participant or watching this presentation for taking the time out of their day to recognize uh, this day and to, um, and to work on themselves as they uh, stumble with us all down this path toward uh, reconciliation. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Merci.